Hello everybody and welcome to Rise of the Rajas, the new official expansion to Age of Empires 2 HD Edition, which can be purchased on Steam. Rise of the Rajas adds four new civilizations, and the focus of this video is going to be in the Khmer. You can find more information and gameplay on all of the new civilizations in the video description below. I will also have a link to my Twitch TV page, where I stream Age of Empires 2 and a wide variety of other games regularly. So the Khmer are classified as a siege and elephant civilization. They have one unique unit, two unique technologies, and three civilization-specific bonuses. In addition, each of the four new civilizations have access to the new Battle Elephant unit in the Castle Age. I will discuss the Khmer Battle Elephant later in the video. The first topics that I'm going to cover are their unique unit and technologies, starting with the Ballista Elephant. The Ballista Elephant is a mounted siege weapon that fires a piercing projectile attack. It can only be created at the castle, and it costs a very hefty 100 food and 80 gold to produce. Due to its piercing attack, the Ballista Elephant damages units in a line, and it is comparable to the Scorpion or the Caravel. What makes the Ballista Elephant unique from those two units, though, is its considerable bulk. The Ballista Elephant boasts a colossal 250 hit points, and the Elite Ballista Elephant has a base 290 hit points. With Bloodlines and Blacksmith Cavalry Armor upgrades, the Ballista Elephant can be a very difficult unit to take down. Ballista Elephants shred right through most infantry units and anything with low pierce armor, but they are not that powerful on their own. Having only 8 to 9 base attack and such high survivability means that the Ballista Elephant will be most powerful when masked up. This unit is not invincible, and its broad unit class means that it carries a number of weaknesses. It counts as an elephant, giving it a devastating weakness to halberdiers, camels, and monks, and it is also weak to units such as siege onagers and the bard cannons, and really any sort of unit with high enough pierce armor, like a huskar or eagle warrior, that can resist its attacks. Much like the elephant archer, the ballista elephant takes some finesse to use correctly, but if you can get a large enough army of them, then they can easily become a force to be reckoned with. The Ballista Elephant is also capable of cutting trees, making it the only unit in the Castle Age that is able to do that. However, it can only cut down trees one at a time, so if you're cutting through a large enough forest, then your opponent will have plenty of time to react. This might not seem like it at a glance, but the ability to cut trees in the Castle Age is incredibly powerful, and will require opponents to play very carefully. A single Ballista Elephant can actually be used to cut through a forest and bypass enemy walls entirely, allowing your more powerful units to raid the enemy economy with ease. This ability should not be underestimated, and I expect that skilled players will really be able to make clever use of it. Just remember that the Ballista Elephant itself is not a great raiding unit. It only facilitates easy raiding with the help of other units, such as Knights. The Ballista Elephant becomes even more interesting when you factor in one of the Khmer's unique technologies, Double Crossbow. They can research Double Crossbow in the Imperial Age, and it allows the Khmer Ballista Elephants and their Scorpions to shoot two projectiles with every attack. Not only is this easily one of the coolest bonuses I've seen in Age of Empires 2, it also happens to be really useful. Firing two projectiles simultaneously creates a much wider area of effect for their attacks, ensuring that more units get hit by the otherwise narrow path. Even though the second projectile deals slightly reduced damage, any units with low pierce armor will still melt after a few attacks. Doubling the area of effect gives their scorpions a truly unique feel, and it encourages opposing players to make use of the staggered formation to avoid taking too much excess damage. It is worth noting that a single unit can be damaged by both projectiles, but they do fan out in a narrow cone, making that less likely, unless they are too close or they're clumping their army too much. For these reasons, you definitely want to avoid fighting the Khmer in any narrow choke points, as their piercing attacks and excellent ranged units will stop you right in your tracks. Their other unique technology, Tusk Swords, is available in the Castle Age, and is researched at the castle. Tusk Swords increases the attack damage of your battle elephants by 3. Thankfully, the Khmer have access to all of the stable upgrades and blacksmith upgrades for battle elephants, allowing them to take full advantage of the extra attack boost. With Tusk Swords and Blacksmith upgrades, more Battle Elephants can have up to 17 attack in the Castle Age and a whopping 23 attack in the Imperial Age. Combined with their Civilization bonuses, the Khmer will have excellent offensive Battle Elephants that will be devastating in melee combat. Now that I have covered the Khmer unique unit and technologies, it's time to move on to their Civilization bonuses. The first one is that their Battle Elephants move 15% faster. 15% faster movement speed makes Khmer Battle Elephants quite strong, and this bonus becomes even more impactful with Careful Micro. Battle Elephants have many weaknesses, including their poor movement speed, high resource cost, and numerous units that counter them, such as monks, pikemen, and camels, 
but they also have very clearly defined strengths in their colossal HP and attack stat. Moving 15% faster is an excellent bonus, and now Khmer Battle Elephants will be more capable of chasing down enemy ranged units and closing the gap so they can take full advantage of the extra damage from Tusk Swords. Giving the Khmer faster Battle Elephants and Tusk Swords is an elegant combination, and one I really look forward to playing around with. Their next bonus is that they require no buildings to advance the next age, or to unlock other buildings in their tech tree. This bonus is extremely creative, and so far there has not been a bonus like this in Age of Empires 2. The possibilities here are endless. Without having to construct specific buildings to advance the next age, or to build other buildings, the Khmer can advance through the ages extremely quickly. It is even possible to reach the Feudal Age in 8 minutes, with standard settings, allowing yourself to go for an incredibly early scout cavalry rush. This is because you do not actually have to build a barracks before building a stable, and if you're feeling particularly crazy, you can even avoid building a mill early on, and instead using your starting scout to push deer under your town center to gather from. Then once you reach the feudal age, you can just plop down a stable immediately and start raiding your opponent's economy with a remarkably fast scout rush. If your opponent did not go for a particularly early feudal age versus an adjacent Khmer player, then he won't have access to spearmen during the initial attack, and will lose a considerable amount of villagers if he is not palisade walled in, or otherwise prepared to micro his villagers carefully. It is also possible for the Khmer player to go for other variations of a fast feudal age, perhaps with towers, galleys, archers, or men-at-arms. These strategies are not defined yet though, and they all carry some legitimate weaknesses. For starters, cutting this many villagers leaves you with a rather weak economy, which reduces the amount of pressure you can apply with any sort of fast feudal age rush. Early scouting, palisade walls, careful villager micro, a three militia drush, your own early feudal age, defensive towers, etc. can all put a dent in the Khmer's early game rush. You may also find that cutting things like a barracks can come back to haunt you when you really need those defensive spearmen to counter your opponent's scout, or night rush, or even worse, battle elephants. There is plenty of room for improvement here, and cutting slightly fewer villagers might end up being the better option. Perhaps this bonus can also be used for an excellent fast castle age rush with things such as knights, or maybe even a straight transition into an economic boom with tons of town centers. I encourage everyone to experiment with this bonus, and I look forward to seeing what types of strategies emerge. Besides advancing through the ages extremely quickly, this bonus is just overall useful for encouraging creative builds that would otherwise be less efficient if you had to spend the extra wood on buildings. The Khmer's last bonus is that their villagers can garrison inside houses. With all the greedy Khmer builds made possible by their last bonus, you would think that the Khmer would really struggle to defend themselves against opposing rushes that are backed by real early game economic or military bonuses. This is still generally the case, but the Khmer do have some tricks up their sleeve. This bonus allows the Khmer to hide their villagers inside the safety of nearby houses during an enemy's rush. As soon as the opposing units move in, Khmer villagers can evacuate and avoid losses to any weaker attacks. Houses are just too difficult to kill in the early Dark and Feudal Ages, and this bonus will give you time to send reinforcements to rescue villagers before the houses fall. This also encourages the Khmer player to be creative with house placement, and always position a few houses near vulnerable areas. Early game rushes often revolve around avoiding enemy town center arrows, so leaving a house next to your lumber camps, mining camps, and mill can be a great way to protect yourself from early aggression. Now onto their team bonus. Having a Khmer teammate will grant you and your allies an extra one range on your scorpions. This range bonus really encourages players to build their own scorpions, but most importantly, it also has fantastic synergy with any civilizations that have their own scorpion-specific bonuses. For example, the Chinese have a unique technology rocketry, which grants their scorpions an additional plus four attack for a grand total of 21 attack for heavy scorpions. That's a very powerful technology, but it is offset by a lack of siege engineers for the Chinese, meaning that the scorpions are missing an additional plus one range that many other civilizations have access to. If the Chinese have a Khmer teammate, then the scorpions no longer have that drawback of having shorter range, so I imagine that this will be a very potent combination. There are also many other civilizations with strong scorpions, such as but not limited to, the Celts, Slavs, and Ethiopians, who will really enjoy the plus one extra range. One thing is for certain, the Khmer bonuses all have excellent utility, and taking full advantage of them will require some creative planning. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to go over everything in each civilization's tech tree, but I will highlight many of the most important ones. In terms of the Khmer tech tree, they have a passable archer range, but a lack of thumbring and arbalist will significantly weaken the strength of their archers as the game drags on. Onto the barracks, the Khmer critically do not have access to champions, 
But with hand cannoneers at the archer range, thankfully the Khmer will still have answers to high pierce armor infantry civilizations like the Goths and the Malians. Taking a look at their stable, the Khmer have a very average set of upgrades, with access to both bloodlines and husbandry, but they are missing Hussar and Paladin, which weakens their late game cavalry. However, they do have excellent fully upgraded battle elephants that are further improved by tusk swords and 15% faster base movement speed, which is even better when paired with husbandry. I would mention exceptional battle elephants as a counter to high pierce armor infantry civilizations, but battle elephants are so weak to pikemen that a civilization would need either champions or hand cannoneers to offset that weakness, and the Khmer thankfully do have hand cannoneers. Onto the dock, we can see that the Khmer have an outstanding dock, and they are only missing heavy demolition ships. Since many of the new maps feature a new terrain called Mangrove Shallows, where both units and ships can pass over, but also you can build buildings on, demolition ships can be used to cleverly ambush enemy armies or harass enemy buildings. So lack of heavy demolition ship is important, but not enough to make a significant dent in the Khmer's power on the water. The Khmer's strong siege and elephants will make them a very strong civilization for slow Imperial Age pushes, but a lack of Mavard Tower will certainly slow that down a bit. The Khmer No Building Requirement bonus would enable a very strong fast castle agent of monks because you can skip the blacksmith, except they are missing many valuable monastery technologies, so I imagine that the Khmer Monk Rush will not be as powerful. I mentioned the blacksmith because it is required to build a siege workshop, which we need for mangonels to pair with our monks. Their strong late game though is reinforced by getting an almost full siege workshop, excluding Siege Onager, as well as getting siege engineers at the university and a nearly full blacksmith. The Khmer Imperial Age Death Ball, composed of Siege, Elephants, and support units like the Halberdier, will likely be strong, but it will be held back by no Siege Onagers, Plate Mail Armor, or Bombard Towers. The last important part of their tech tree will be the lack of both Two-Man Saw and Guilds, both of which will weaken their late-game economy. Overall, the Khmer are a very difficult civilization to evaluate at a glance. They have a truly unique set of bonuses and units that offer a great deal of utility, and take some creative thinking to get the most out of. I imagine that their early game rushes will be quite potent with the ability to advance quickly or go for unique builds, as well as defend at home by hiding villagers in your houses. In the late game, the Khmer also have a strong set of units and bonuses with their excellent battle elephants, gunpowder, and siege weapons. The Khmer are likely to struggle though a bit in the mid game after their initial rush peters out and before they can build a large enough economy to support their most expensive units and technologies. But once they get there, they have such a fun set of units, and there are few things more satisfying than a death ball containing ballista elephants and heavy scorpions with extra range, which fire two bolts with every attack. Opposing armies without onagers, bombard cannons, cavalry, or high pierce armor infantry will get easily mowed down in choke points, and the Khmer player will sustain very few losses. They can even cut through trees with their ballista elephants, opening up even more potential strategies. The viability of the Khmer depends heavily on what players can accomplish with these bonuses and the resulting unorthodox playstyle. I find this civilization to be incredibly interesting, and I look forward to exploring what the Khmer are truly capable of. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider leaving a like rating, as well as a comment below. I always read all of the comments, even if I don't get a chance to respond to each of them individually. While I do content for far more than just Age of Empires 2, if you are looking for more AoE2 content, then you are definitely in the right place. My channel has all sorts of Age of Empires 2 videos, including expert game commentaries, videos in Rise of the Rajas, as well as content relating to a wide variety of other games. Showing your support for the other games I play really helps the longevity of the channel, and encourages me to continue creating more videos like this one. This video also uses a lot of footage from my custom AI, Resonance Bot, which is a great practice partner for all skill levels. You can find a link to subscribe to it on the Steam Workshop below, just make sure you read the info on the page first. And last but not least, I do livestream on Twitch TV regularly, and I'd love to have you as part of our wonderful community. You can find my livestream schedule on my Twitch page by scrolling underneath the video player there. I update it every few days, and if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter, you will get updates on when I'm streaming next. As always, I appreciate the support, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.